So I have an asteroid named after me. And Congratulations. I, I don't mean to brag or anything. I don't Can't mean, you, like, get a star named after you online? Not le- not, not, not authentically. You just get robbed. <laughs> <laughs> they just pretend. They'll send you a map with your, with, your, with your name drawn in the map. So you and, pay for a piece of paper. Yeah, they claim that it goes, gets registered with the astrophysicist, but it doesn't. Um, oh. No, we, there's only one way we name stars, and that's by committee and by traditions and this sort of thing. Uh, it's, they're fascinating traditions. So planets are named after Roman gods. And pl- planet moons uh, are named after Greek characters in the life of the Greek god who's the counterpart to that Roman god. Wow. So Jupiter, for example, one of its moons is Ganymede. Ganymede was the manservant of Zeus, and Zeus and Jupiter were corresponding uh, gods in mm. Greek and Roman. And not only that, two th- uh, what's the number? Is it a... About half, somewhere around there, of all the stars in the night sky that have names have Arabic names. So in my field, we have deep respect for people who made great inroads into understanding the natural universe. And the golden age of Islam from a thousand years ago made material contributions in this regard. And, of course, Greek and Roman legends and this sort of thing. So there they are in its influence on Western culture. So, yeah, no, the universe is a fun place. Pretty fun place. Oh, yeah. So this James Webb telescope, in terms of its ability to recognize things, like what magnitude of improvement are we talking about from the Yeah, factor the of Hubble? 10. Yeah, factor, factor of 10. 10. Yeah, easily. That's right. Well, the, a factor of 10 for the things Hubble could see, but it's incalculable when it sees things that Hubble could have never seen because mm. Hubble was not tuned for the infrared. So then you can't even compare it. It's a complete uh, other window opened up to the universe for you. So what has changed in terms of our understanding? The, the, the web has been in the, in the million mile orbit or however far away it is for how long now? Uh, well, it got there and then we did some engineering. So I, I guess a year, year and a half. Yeah. And, and w- what has changed in our understanding? So that's, that's been people's first question. And what I want to do is temper that to say something a little different. So, yes, we expect James Webb to make great discoveries. We expect that. But the first order of business is hardly ever, let's discover something new today. It's, here's something that we have limited understanding of. Let's improve on that. And in so doing, we deepen our understanding of how things work in the universe. That doesn't always involve overturning a previous idea or discovering something that nobody ordered. All right? That will happen. We fully expect that to happen. But we targeted parts of the sky initially because we know other telescopes have gone there before. And we're going to say, how can we further advance and deepen our understanding? One thing it's going to be able to do, and it has already done, we have, you know how many exoplanets there are? And I don't know how many of your audience was born after 1995. How many 27-year-olds and younger? Probably quite a few. Quite a few. Okay. So I will take this opportunity to knight them Generation X exoplanet. Ah, <laughs> 1995 uh, was the first exoplanet discovered, a planet orbiting another star. And... Uh, I'll never forget that because it was my first time on national television. Uh, I was freshly minted as director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. And NBC sent a uh, – New York City this is the media news headquarters, right, of all the networks. So NBC sent an action cam. They interviewed me because of my title, not because they knew or gave a crap who I was. I, my title was director of the planetarium. And so – I gave my best professorial reply. I said, well, the Doppler shift, this is how it's discovered and what we do and how we measure it. And, and I was describing the fact that when you discover these planets, you don't actually see the planet. You see the effect of the planet's gravity on the host star. And so if you'd watch the host star, the host star like jiggles, okay, just a little bit in response to the planet going back and forth around it. So you're measuring the star. So I, I motioned that like with my hips. And that evening on the evening news, 
that's all they showed was me jiggling my hips. <laughs> I said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, that's how you're going to do this. Okay. <laughs> you don't want me to be Professor Neil. You want me to be Soundbite Neil. Uh... All right, so from then on, I practiced my sound bites. Mm. And a sound bite's like three sentences. Oh, so you recognize that this is the format now. Correct. Yeah. And I said, I, I can't just give them my stump speech as professor of astrophysics. I, it has to work in their medium. And, I, and so I went home and stood in front of the mirror and had people just shout out things to me, anything in the universe, any idea, object, person, place, or thing. And I would come up with like three sentences that are interesting, oh. make you smile, and be tasty enough to want to tell someone else the anatomy of a soundbite. Mm. So try it. Say anything in the whole universe. How do we know how... No, just, just one word. Just okay. say anything.